speaker of the morning, Aisha Kareshi from uh, Istanbul in Turkey, and she'll talk about algebraic and homology properties. I start again. <laughs> so I'm happy to introduce the last speaker of the morning, Aisha Kareshi from Istanbul, Turkey, and the title is up there. Please. Okay, thank you very much. So first I want to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful school and workshop and for the invitation. I will talk about polyomino ideals today. So uh, the idea is, uh, so, so the, basically the motivation is starts from the ideals uh, generated by T minors uh, of a matrix, uh, of a genetic matrix. So uh, in other words, the later, uh, uh, sorry, the determinantal ideals and then their quotient rings, which are known as determinantal rings. More generally, later, later determinantal ideals and uh, later determinantal rings. So uh, as we already saw in the morning in Alessandro's talk, a little bit of reference of uh, ideals of uh, T minors of a certain matrix. So uh, I, I'm sure that most of you are already familiar with that. Uh, there are some nice references here. So what we do is that, okay, we take a matrix X where the entries are, we can just simply call them variables. They are indeterminates. So let's call it X. And then for any fixed T, for any admissible T, we are taking, uh, uh, we are considering all the T cross three submatrices, looking at their determinants, in other words, T minors. Okay, and then we are create, generating ideals with these T minors, and uh, these ideals are called determinantal ideals, and then the quotient ring. So this is denoted by ITX. When we take the quotient here, uh, this is the determinantal ring, usually denoted by RTX. More generally, now, uh, we also uh, know the definition, I mean, you might have seen it before, one-sided ladder. So what is the idea? Now we fix a shape inside this matrix. Uh, looks like a ladder, so it's called one-sided ladder. And now we are just restricting ourselves to those T minors, uh, or in other words, those T cross three submatrices that lie within this shape. And then we generate the ideal ideal of T minors uh, called ladder determinantal ideal. We can make it a little bit more general. We can make this shape look like this. So now we have the staircase on both sides, uh, known as two-sided ladder. And uh, so if I call it Y, so this is the ladder determinantal ring. Uh, okay. So I will put it here. Oh, I already... So, as a generalization, so this uh, one-sided ladder and two-sided ladder, okay, they were introduced by Abayankar. Uh, later, later, it was shown that, okay, these ladder determinantal rings, they are domain by Narasimhan, Kohan Mokole property by Herzog and Chung. Konka then uh, proved the normality for these shapes. Now the idea is that, okay, we do, we generalize it a little bit, these shapes, and let's say, now I am talking about uh, this shape inside the matrix. Yeah, and now I want to uh, study uh, the ideals uh, of T minors, uh, such that the corresponding matrices, they are contained inside this shape. Okay, so just going from here to here, uh, considering uh, a little bit more arbitrary shapes inside the matrix. So here now the words polyomino come from, because just to identify these shapes, calling them later here, and calling them polyomino here. And in the beginning, what we are doing, we are restricting ourselves to just t equals to two. So we will be talking about ideals generated by only two minors, so only two cross two submatrix, because that's the easiest case to deal with. <laughs> but of course, one can define it, you know, for any uh, for any admissible t, you know, as long as there is a t cross t matrix contained inside. So in other words, uh, we are talking about quadratic binomial ideals uh, in the polynomial ring whose variables are coming from the entries of the matrix. Okay, so now talking about the binomial ideals, quadratic binomial ideals, we have seen some other classes also. So uh, the ideals generated by, for example, adjacent to minors, 
uh, motivated by the applications in algebraic statistics, some of the references I've shown here. And then ideas generated by arbitrary set of two minors in a two cross n matrix. These are very well known as binomial edge ideas. We saw them multiple times last week in several talks uh, uh, in the school. So for binomial edge ideal, yeah, we are restricting ourselves to only two rows, two cross n matrix, and we are taking any collection of two minors here. So now, polyominoes. We, we define now this polyomino ideals. So polyominoes are plane figures obtained by joining unit squares that we call cell, edge to edge. In nutshell, they look like this. <laughs> so what we have here, for example, in the first picture, we can see that they are, we have unit squares. They are joined together with each other. Uh, so this unit square, we are calling them cells. And uh, we have five cells. Actually, in all of these polyominoes, we have five cells. So they appear basically in recreational mathematics, mostly in combinatorics, talking about their enumeration problem, tiling, uh, also their relation with dyke words and Moskin words appearing in, a, in, 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 in the study of these algebraic languages. Uh, but so what we did here, basically, uh, we just used these uh, shapes of polyominoes to put a name here. So the idea is just to study the ideal of two minors, and now just to identify these shapes, since they look like this, so okay, we just put the name here, use this uh, word here, polyominoes, and call these ideals that later we will generate here as polyomino ideals. So, but uh, this is, <coughs> polyominoes themselves, they actually appear in mostly in combinatorics. And the most uh, well-known problem about here is uh, motivated by some application in physics, uh, cell growth problem. Given a fixed number of cells, let's say we want to construct all possible polyominoes of uh, uh, cells, uh, uh, let's say up to 10. So how many distinct polyominoes one can write up to translation, rotation, and reflection, and so on. So this is one of the major uh, problem. Uh, in, in theory of polyominoes, studied in combinatorics. And now we will define the polyomino ideals. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, as I said, so what we are going to do, we are going to look at these shapes and we will associate some quadratic binomial ideals which are uh, uh, coming from the ideals of two minors uh, of a matrix. Uh, so first we put some terminology and some notation. We are taking uh, a partial order in N2. Uh, when we talk about N2, we will just restrict ourselves to the positive uh, integer points only. Because what is the idea why we are talking about N2? Because we can identify the entry entries of this matrix as uh, points in N2 uh, with the positive uh, indices. Okay, then we have the definition of an interval in N2. So we take two points. And then uh, uh, we write an uh, uh, interval just like as the, all the integer points uh, uh, within, within these two uh, fixed points. So for A to B, we are taking everything that is in between them. So an interval will look like this. If I have this point and this point, A and B, so I take all the integer points and it, it, it will look like a rectangle in general. Okay. So now, if I have an interval of size one, it's, it's a square. So this is what we are calling a cell. For example, this is a cell from ij to i plus one, j plus one. These pink points are vertices of this cell. The corner points, from here we can identify the diagonal and the anti-diagonal corner points. And then uh, the edges are uh, the boundaries of this cell. Okay, so what is a polyomino? The formal definition is we are taking a bunch of cells in N2, these unit squares, and if we can reach from one cell to the other cell via connected path, then we say that, okay, it's a polyomino. In other words, we take a bunch of these cells. If the shape looks like connected, it's, it's a polyomino. So we, do, we, do not, uh, we, we want to be able to reach from one cell to the other cell. So for example, here, uh, a path from C1 to C8 is shown. So we are moving edge by edge from one cell to the other. So this is, this is a polyomino. 
Okay, we fix a polyomino, a bunch of uh, uh, cells in N2 that can be also viewed as the entries uh, inside the matrix. And then we um, write the vertex set of P as the union of all the vertices of all the cells that are contained in our polyomino. And then we assign a uh, polynomial ring to it. So in this polynomial ring, the indices of the variables are coming from the vertices of polyomino. Okay, so just like when we are writing this string xij, uh, the variables that are coming from the entries of the matrix. Uh, inner interval, what is the inter inner interval of a polyomino? When all the cells of that interval belong to our collection, belong to our polyomino, we call this an inner interval. So for example, here, this red, uh, sh uh, the interval shown with the, marked with the red lines, this is our inner interval, because all the six cells of this interval is contained in our collection. So, I uh, know, what did I do? Uh, okay. Okay. So, in this polyomino, for example, this is the cell that I'm not putting in my collection. Yeah? Uh, okay, here I have a example of, of an interval which is not an inner interval because this cell in this interval is not contained in the collection. Okay, so what we do now, we take our polyomino, we fix a shape, and then we, uh, for, for every interval, so we have now this diagonal and anti-diagonal entries, so basically we have an hour two cross two submatrix, we take its determinant, uh, and then this is what we are calling here inner to minor, I think I'm <laughs> pressing some wrong button again and again. Uh, okay. So given this interval, we take the uh, determinant of the corresponding matrix, and we are calling it an inner minor of the polyomino P. Okay. And now we take all the inner minors of P, and uh, we generate an ideal. It's a quadratic binomial ideal. We are calling it a polyomino ideal and the quotient ring denoted by KP, coordinate ring of uh, the associated polyomino. Okay, so this is the structure that we are going to talk about. So again, the idea is just to study the ideal of two minors of more arbitrary shape inside the matrix. But later on along the study, it became, uh, uh, I mean, we noticed that, okay, this combinatorics of polyomino, apparently it's, uh, it, it made it very easy to study uh, most of the algebraic and homological properties of this quotient ring. So one can actually describe many invariants in just, in, in terms of the combinatorics of the associated polyomino. So we will see it uh, in a moment. So, I mean, I'm sure that, okay, the definition because of letter determinantal ideals and rings, it might be clear, but just to be more precise, I put another example here. So for example, we are taking these red entries and we, are, we only want to have uh, all the two minors that we can create from these red entries. So given that one, I am assigning this polyomino with these four cells. So these red marks, these red entries can be identified as the vertices of this polyomino. And uh, then we are writing all the two minors that we can construct here. So this is the uh, polyomino ideal associated to this polyomino mark in the red entries. Okay, so this is the ideal that we are talking about. Okay, good. So of course it generalizes the class of one-sided and two-sided letter. And also, uh, if you are familiar with Hebe rings, that are uh, toric rings associated with the distributive lattices. So if we have a planar distributive lattice, we take the Hebe ring that can also be identified as a coordinate ring of a certain uh, uh, polyomino of, cer of certain shape. Okay, so when we have an ideal generated by an arbitrary set of two minor, of course, one, first one would like to know that the, the quotient ring defined by them is if it is a domain, if the ideal is prime, if not, if it is radical uh, or not, or what are the primary components. So this, we, we just start from the very basic question. We just want to know, okay, when uh, these uh, ideals, they, they define a domain. Uh, in case of two cross n matrix, the case of so-called binomial edge ideal, we know that they are always radical. You just pick any bunch of two minors, you generate an ideal, is always radical. We know the primary decomposition, we know many nice properties. 
Uh, and this is not true as long as we just increase the rows to three. If you take just randomly some two miners generate an ideal, it need not to be radical. One can write many easy examples. So we start with this question that, okay, when these ideals of these inner two miners, polyomino ideals, when they are prime, when they are radical, and so on. So I will just now uh, talk about some nice shapes uh, uh, of different polyominoes and then what the sort of properties that we know so far. So here we have what we call a row convex polyomino. So it means that if you have two cells in a row, you have the whole row inside your polyomino. So this is not column convex, for example, because we have these two in one column, but the middle one is missing. So this is row convex. This one is column convex. If a polyomino is both row and column convex, we just simply call it convex polyomino. So for example, here, this kind of a shape inside the matrix, it can be identified uh, with a convex polyomino. So for these uh, shapes, uh, so this was one of the first results, uh, that uh, these ideas, they define a uh, domain. And uh, in fact, Kohan Macaulay normal domain, we know the dimension in the terms of the vertices and the number of cells uh, within the polyomino. In fact, they are causal also. Uh, now, more interesting shapes that we can create inside, the, uh, inside these matrices. So simple polyomino, uh, rather than giving the more combinatorial definition, I've just put some uh, pictures uh, where one can actually <clears throat> understand maybe better. So what do we mean by simple polyomino? So simple polyomino here just means that there is no any hole embedded inside the polyomino. So for example here, this cell is not inside our collection. So there is, there is like a hole topologically embedded inside the polyomino. So this one is not simple. However, this is simple. There is no hole embedded inside. Okay, so these are kind of like the, uh, because once we start having holes, uh, things become much more complicated. For simple polyominoes, uh, it, it remained an open question for a while, but then Herzog and Madani, and then separately with some, uh, 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 with my collaborators that, okay, we were able to show that, in fact, in this case also, we again get a causal Kohan Macaulay domain of uh, uh, dimension described in the terms of vertices and the cells of the polyomino. The idea is actually that uh, once one can, uh, first we show that this polyomino ring here, this is isomorphic to a semi-group ring with quadratic generators, where these ij's are coming from the vertices of polyomino. So once we identify it in this form, this is much simpler than uh, talking about this more complicated structure. After this identification, so it becomes a little bit easier to talk about it because here we just have quadratic binomials in our, uh, uh, um, in, in our toric ring here. Okay. Now, some other known classes, uh, list of prime polyominoes, where we know our quotient ring is integral domain. So, okay, convex and simple polyominoes we know. Then, now we allow holes. So, if the hole is itself a convex polyomino, here one can again argue with some localization techniques, okay, that we have again, uh, uh, um, our coordinate ring of po uh, polyomino ideal is again an integral domain. Then, Grid polyominoes and thin polyominoes, I'm not, I, I haven't put the definition, but uh, the names are exactly, you know, what one would imagine, grid polyominoes, something that looks like grid, and then there are a bunch of holes. Thin polyomino, it really looks thin, so it means that we don't have uh, four cells embedded inside. So we have parts of sort of like this form. So just cells joined together with each other, and we do not have sort of like a tetromino four cells uh, in this form inside. So with this thin structure again, these are known to be prime. And uh, polyominoes, if they admit a quadratic Grobner basis, uh, by using that, or identifying them with the suitable lattices, that okay, they are again, um, they define a prime ideal 
closed path polyominoes with certain zigzag fork combinatorially that one can define inside polyominoes. They are also known to be prime. And then Maschia, Rinaldo, and Romeo recently they uh, conjectured that, okay, if polyomino does not have this so-called zigzag fork, then the polyomino ideal doesn't matter how many holes are embedded inside, but the polyomino ideal will be prime. But this is, some, uh, this is a very recent work. Uh, and zigzag walk is again something defined completely combinatorially in terms of the language of polyominoes. Okay, and there is no known example of polyomino ideal that is not radical, which is kind of nice because when we are taking these arbitrary minors, uh, even in a three cross n matrix, we know that they are not radical. But as long as we fix uh, this polyomino, we fix a shape on them. Uh, apparently, we expect them to be always radical. We do not have any known examples so far. Uh, very recently, uh, Sisto, Navara, and Biro, okay, this is the first paper where the radical property of the polyomino ideals have been discussed. They, uh, in the case of this closed path in polyomino, when they are not prime, they show that they, it is radical, and they also gave the primary decomposition uh, of, of polyomino ideal in this case. Uh, and this is, I think, the only paper where the radical property is discussed. Okay, some other properties that we know for these rings. Characterization uh, of convex polyomino when they have linear resolution and when the first CDG module in the resolution is uh, uh, generated in a, uh, uh, is linearly generated, so it's uh, linearly related uh, polyominoes. Uh, and then some bounds for the regularity and multiplicity and characterization of convex polyominoes that satisfy green leather spill condition, NP properties, uh, and then uh, Cherney Davis conjecture for simple thin polyominoes and their Gorenstein, so this conjecture is discussed. So mostly for convex and simple polyominoes and very particular classes of these polyominoes, we know some um, nice, uh, some, some dis discussion of some nice homological and algebraic invariants and some other properties, but most of the things, because they are relatively new class of ideas, so most of the things are still unknown. Uh, okay, so I have time, right? Maybe 10 minutes or so. So I will just say now a little bit uh, about that, how this combinatorics of polyomino happen to be very useful in the study of these ideals of two minor. So one can actually really use it to describe some, for example, regularity and Hilbert series and other nice properties of, uh, of these ideals. Um, okay, convex polyomino. Uh, in, com in, in, in theory of polyominoes, uh, convex, the convexity of a polyomino is measured by the terms of the paths that you define in them. So in other words, uh, if you can reach from one cell to the other cell inside the polyomino with at most k turns, so every time you change the direction, it means that you are taking a turn. So if you can reach from one cell to the other cell in at most one turn, this is called one convex. If you can reach from one cell to the other cell in at most two turns, okay, it is two convex and so on. So there is a notion of k-convex polyomino. So the, this one is the one convex polyomino because of one turn in the shape of L. So in combinatorics, they are calling it L-convex polyomino, uh, which is uh, studied extensively and many nice properties of these polyominoes are known, which actually helped to uh, study the algebraic properties, basically ideals that are generated by minors of these shapes. So when we have a L-convex polyomino, by using most of uh, the combinatorial results that are known, apparently one can uh, reconstruct them in the shape of a one-sided leather. So one can deform them by using these results, identify them as a one-sided leather, show that they define the same algebra, and then uh, we can uh, use what we know from the one-sided letter, translate these properties back to L-convex polyomino, and then we have some very nice consequences. So for example, uh, non-attacking rooks. So this is a polyomino. By saying non-attacking rooks, just like in the chessboard, we are choosing uh, one, at most one cell from, from a column in a row. So in chessboard of size eight cross eight, we can put maximum eight non-attacking uh, rooks. So for example here, if I put these two rooks in this pruned chessboard, I cannot put a third rook 
because if I will try to put another row, it will be either in the same column as these two or in the same row. So basically, I am choosing cells in distinct rows and distinct columns. Okay. Now, if I choose a different configuration, I can actually put four rooks in this prune chessboard. Okay. Uh, given a prune chessboard, there are very few classes uh, of chessboards that are that one knows what what is. Uh, the maximum number of rooks that you can put. Okay, for eight cross eight, we know we can put eight maximum, but when you cut it, you create something new. How many rooks can you put? It's a very nice recreational problem with some nice application, but mostly studied in combinatorics. So let RP be the number of maximal rooks that we can place on our polyomino P. And then apparently for L convex, regularity is exactly equals to the rook number of the polyomino. And this result then later motivated that, okay, so there is this nice interpretation. Can we use more combinatorics of polyominoes to describe some other properties of these polyomino ideals? And uh, that happened to be also true. So uh, most of the properties, okay, in L case of L-convex -con polyominoes are known, but for example, if we go to two convex, that has not been studied uh, yet, for example. Uh, okay, so I, I think I have five more minutes, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be quick. So we take a polyomino P and we denote RK to be the number of ways of arranging K non-attacking rooks on cells of P. Okay, in how many ways I can put two rooks, in how many ways I can put three rooks, for example, and so on. Uh, so in, uh, this is the oldest reference that I could find uh, for these rook polynomials that are also related to matching polynomials. I, I mean, okay, they have been studied, I, I think, for centuries, these kind of problems, but the formal definition with association with the uh, um, matching polynomial, up, up to my knowledge, this was the earliest reference that I could find, but I, uh, yeah, uh, but this is my own literature service, so I'm not so sure. <laughs> Okay, so he, uh, the root polynomial is defined uh, in combinatorics as following. So it's a generating function. Uh, so for t to the power k, our coefficient is rk, uh, which is the number of phase of arranging k non-attacking rooks. Okay, and the degree of this is, of course, is then the rook number, the maximum rooks that you can place on your polyomino. So for example, here, if I take this polyomino, in how many ways I can put no rooks? is like empty, doing nothing, only one way to do it. How many ways you can put one rook? It is exactly equal to the number of cells, which are five here. In how many ways we can arrange two rooks? They are given here, all the possible ways, six of them. In how many ways we can put three rooks here? So this is the only unique way to do it. Uh, then, okay, so here the coefficient of t cube is one. So this is the rook polynomial. Uh, so as I mentioned before, a polyomino is said to be thin if there is no any sub-polyomino of this shape. So there is no square tetromino embedded inside it. So we have uh, only thin strip of, of cells just going uh, uh, along. So for this shape of polyominoes, uh, so this is a simple thin polyomino for example, there are no holes embedded and there is no any square tetromino embedded inside. So if we consider this kind of shapes in our matrix, uh, we apparently have the following result. So we look at the reduced Hilbert series, we look at the H polynomial, uh, the coefficient of the, uh, so actually the H polynomial coincides with the root polynomial of P. So this is uh, something which seems a little bit strange, that why? But uh, uh, yeah, apparent because when we are taking, when we are putting the rooks, we are choosing these distinct cells in the rows and column. And uh, we know, I, I mean, I haven't mentioned much about Grobner basis, but we know actually quite enough about the Grobner basis of these shapes. In particular, in most of these cases, the set of generator gives you uh, the Grobner basis with some nice monomial orders, where the, uh, the initial terms can be recognized as either the coming from the diagonal terms of a cell or the anti-diagonal terms of a cell. So for example, if I have something like this shape, a very simple one, 
this polyomino with these four cells. I take all the minors. So let's say my diagonal terms are coming from this, uh, uh, from the diagonal, uh, sorry, for the initial terms uh, are coming from the diagonal corners. Uh, and if I choose, for example, this, I put a rook here and rook here. In other words, this diagonal has nothing to do with this diagonal. So in the initial ideal, we have certain regular sequences embedded inside, which can be identified as an edge ideal also. So basically, I mean, the proofs, the ideas are coming from this theory. So it is not so, it, it, it is not so actually unnatural that this kind of uh, results are true, that rook polynomial actually really plays an important role in the properties, uh, algebraic and homological properties of these um, polyomino ideals. Okay. So yeah, uh, here the Hilbert series, as I said before, it coincides with the rook polynomial here. Uh, does the similar result hold for any simple polyomino? So I, uh, let me actually just start with the definition, uh, sorry, with an example. So this is a simple polyomino. Now uh, we have this shape, uh, this square tetromino inside, right? And uh, so in how many ways I can put zero rooks is an empty set. In how many ways I can put one rook, I can put it on the cell A or B or C and so on. In how many ways I can put two rooks. So either I put in AD or I can choose B and C and so on. So this is all the possible arrangements and this R3 is all the possible arrangements to put three rooks. Okay, once we have these kind of shapes, uh, we, have to, we have to fix something about the rook arrangement and that we do in the following way. So this is the rook polynomial here. Huh. So what we do, uh, A and D, they are diagonal corners of an interval such that the anti-diagonal cells here also, they are, they are also inside the polyomino. So we identify this AD with BC. So now whenever we have, our, we have a rectangular interval, so if you are putting rooks in the diagonal cells, we can always put them in the anti-diagonal cells also and obtain uh, uh, another rook configuration. And so we identify them, okay, this switching operation, sort of a switching operation. Uh, and so uh, we say that, okay, one configuration can be obtained from the other one if uh, we can perform some switches and then starting from one, we obtain the other one. This is an equivalence relation. So we mod out all such configurations and then we define this new polynomial that we are denoting by R tilde. So up to this equivalence, we are co counting all the distinct ways of putting rooks uh, uh, with a cert certain number of rooks on, on our polyomino. So after this, a little bit modification, uh, we gave the conjecture that, okay, for any simple polyomino, when you look at the reduced Hilbert series, the H, poly, uh, uh, sorry, the H vector uh, will correspond to this equivalent rook configurations. Uh, the proof is done for uh, the so-called parallelogram polyominoes which are in fact just two-sided letters. L-convex polyominoes, which is uh, again a very wide class, but again the question remains still open that once we are outside L, uh, we, we talk about K-convexity, so if K is bigger than one, we don't know. And all the polyominoes with cells up to, I mean, that have 14, up to 14 cells. And this is, that was done by using Macaulay and, uh, um, yeah, so this is because of the computational evidence. Okay, I will finish here. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any short questions? Thank you. Not, not in all cases, only uh, for simple polyominoes we know when there are no holes. And then, uh, so once we allow hole, so there are some classes where we know, but in general, no. Yeah, so for simple polyominoes and some other particular classes, but not always. So this, in case of simple polyominoes, uh, 
to, to, to write this conjecture, we are identifying them as non-attacking. Yeah, but uh, um, in, in combinatorial references, what I've seen is that it depending on the author, sometimes they consider it attacking, sometimes not. But for simple polyominoes, yeah, we, yeah, if they are not in this, I mean, there is a you know gap between, so okay, they are non-attacking. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Thank you.